All right, so today we're going to read chapter nine of Hoot. Nine. School was nerve wracking. Every time Roy entered one of his classrooms, the other kids stopped what they were doing and stared. It was as if they were all surprised to see that he was still alive with all of his limbs intact. After leaving algebra class, Roy heard a stupendous phony fart noise coming from behind him in the hallway. Garrett. He took Roy by the shirt sleeve and led him into the bathroom. You look sick. You should go home early, Garrett advised. I feel fine, Roy said, which wasn't true. He still had a headache from the thumping Roy gave him on the bus ride. Dude, listen to me, Garrett said. I don't care how you think you feel. You're sick, really sick, okay? You need to call your mom and you need to go home. What have you heard? He'll be waiting for you after seventh period. So let him right wait, Roy said. Garrett tugged Roy into one of the toilet stalls and locked it on the inside. This is so lame, said Roy. Garrett touched a finger to his lips. I know a guy in Dana's PE class. He says Dana's going to snatch you before you get on the bus home. And do what? Duh. Right here at school? How? Roy asked. Bro, I wouldn't hang around to find out. Hey, you never told me you busted, his, busted him in the chops, too. That wasn't me. Sorry. Roy unlocked the toilet stall and gently nudged his friend out. So what are you going to do? Garrett called over the top of the door. Take a pee. No, I'm talking about you know who. I'll think of something. But what? Even if Roy managed to elude Dana Matherson this afternoon, the drama would start all over again Monday. Dana would resume the stalking, and Roy would have to dream up another escape plan. And that's how it would be every single day until school let out in June. Roy had other options, none particularly appealing. If he had reported Dana to Miss Hennepin, she would do nothing more than summon him to her office for a stern lecture, which Dana would laugh off. Who could take seriously a vice principal with one gnarly hair sprouting off of her lip? If Roy told his parents about the Dana situation, they might be alarmed enough to withdraw him from Trace Middle. Then he would end up getting busted to some, pri bust to some private school where he'd be forced to wear the same dorky uniform every day and, according to Garrett, learn Latin. A third alternative was for Roy to try apologizing to Dana again, this time oozing remorse and sincerity. Not only would that be groveling, it probably wouldn't achieve the desired effect. Dana would still hassle him without mercy. His final option was to stand and fight. Roy was a practical boy. He knew the odds of were overwhelmingly against him. He had the quickness and the brains on his side, but Dana was big enough to crush him like a grape. Roy remembered the time that he and his father had talked about fighting. It is important to stand up for what's right, Mr. Eberhardt said, but sometimes there's a fine line between courage and stupidity. Roy suspected that fighting Dana Matherson fell into the second category. While he disliked the prospect of getting beaten into a pulp, what worried him even more was the effect that it would have on his mother. He was very conscious of being an only child, and he knew his mom would be devastated if something bad happened to him. Roy had almost had a little sister, though he wasn't supposed to know about it. His mother carried the baby to five months, and then one night she got terribly sick and an ambulance rushed her to the hospital. When she came home a few days later, the baby wasn't there anymore, and nobody ever really explained why. Roy was only four years old at the time, and his parents were so upset that he was afraid to ask questions. A few years later, an older cousin told him what a miscarriage was and confided that Roy had Roy's mom had lost a baby girl. Ever since then, he tried not to give his parents extra reasons to worry about him. Whether on horseback, bike, or snowboard, he refrained from doing some of the wild daredevil stunts that boys his age usually tried. Not because he feared his safety, but because he felt it was his solemn duty as an only child. Yet, there he was this morning on the school bus, insulting the same pea-brained thug who had already had a mortal grudge against him. Sometimes Roy didn't understand what came over him. Sometimes he was too proud for his own good. The last class of the day was American history. After the bell, Roy waited for the other students to file out ahead of him. Then, cautiously, he peeked out into the hallway. No sign of Dana Matherson. Roy, is something wrong? It was Mr. Ryan, the history teacher, standing behind him. No, everything's fine, Roy said breezily, stepping out of the classroom. Mr. Ryan closed the door behind him. Going home too, Roy asked. I wish, I've got a great papers. Roy didn't know Mr. Ryan well, but he walked with him all the way to the faculty lounge. Roy made small talk and tried to act casual while constantly checking behind him to see if Dana was lurking. Mr. Ryan had played football in college, and since he hadn't gotten smaller, any smaller since then, Roy felt fairly safe. It was almost as good as walking with his dad. You taking the bus home, Mr. Roy Royan asked? Sure, Roy said. But isn't the pickup on the other side of the school? Oh, I'm just getting some exercise. When they reached the door of the faculty lounge, Mr. Ryan said, don't forget the quiz on Monday. Right, War of 1812. I'm ready, said Roy. Yeah, who won the Battle of Lake Erie? 
Commodore Perry. Which one, Matthew or Oliver? Roy took a guess. Matthew? R Mr. Ryan winked. Study a little more, he said, but have a good weekend. Then Roy was alone in the hall. It was amazing how rapidly schools emptied after the final bell, as if someone called the plug, pulled the plug under a giant whirlpool. Roy listened closely for footsteps, sneaking footsteps, but heard only the tick, tick, tick of the clock mounted above the science lab. Roy observed that he had exactly four minutes to reach the bus pickup zone. He wasn't worried, though, because he had already mapped a shortcut through the gym. His plan was to be along the very last to board the bus. That way he could grab one of the empty seats up front and jump off quickly at his stop. Dana and his cronies customarily occupied the bath row, back rows and seldom bothered the kids sitting up near the front near the driver. Not that Mr. Kelsey would ever notice, Roy thought. He jogged to the end of the hallway and turned right, heading for the double doors that marked the back entrance to the gym. He almost made it, too. Let's be crystal clear about this, Mr. Brannett. You didn't report it to the police? No, so, no, sir, Curly said empathetically into the phone. So there shouldn't be any paperwork, correct? No possible way for this latest travesty to end up in the press? Not that I can figure, Mr. Muckle. For Curly, it had been another long, discouraging day. The sun had finally broken through the clouds, but after that it was downhill. The construction site remained uncleared and the earth moving equipment was sitting idle. Curly had stalled as long as possible before, before phoning Mother Paula's corporate headquarters. Is this your idea, idea of a sick joke? Chuck Muckle snarled, snarled. It ain't no joke. So tell me again, Mr. Brannett, every miserable detail. So Curly had repeated everything, beginning from when he arrived at the site that morning, the first sight of trouble having Callow waving a tattered red umbrella and chasing his four attack dogs along the inside perimeter of the fence. He was shrieking hysterically in German. Not wishing to be mauled by the dogs or gored by the umbrella, Curly had remained outside the gate watching in puzzlement. A Coconut Grove police cruiser had pulled up to the gate, Officer Delenko, the same cop who had dozed off while guarding the construction site. It was because of him that the spray painting fiasco had made the newspaper and gotten Curly into hot water with Mother Paula's company. I was on my way to the station when I saw the commotion, Officer Delenko said, raising his voice over the barking Rottweilers. What's wrong with those dogs? Nothing, Curly told him. It's just a training exercise. The cop had bought it and driven away, much to Curly's relief. Once the Rottweilers were secured on leashes, Callow had hustled them into the carpenter truck and locked the tailgate. Furiously, he turned towards Curly and jabbed the umbrella in the air. You! You try to kill my dogs! The foreman had raised his palms. What are you talking about? Callow had thrown the, the gate open and stomped up to Curly, who was wondering if he should pick up a rock for self-defense. Callow was drenched in sweat, the veins in his neck bulging. Snakes! He spit out the word. What snakes? Yeah, you know what snakes. The place is crawling with them, poisonous ones. Here, Callow had wriggled one of his pinky fingers. Poison snakes with shiny tails. No offense, but you're nutty as a fruitcake. Curly had never once seen a snake on Mother Paula's site, and he would have remembered if he had. Snakes freaked him out. Nuts, you say? Callow seized him under one arm and led him to the portable trailer that served as Curly's office. There, coiled comfortably on the second step, was a thick, modded specimen that Curly recognized as a cottonmouth water moccasin, common in southern Florida. Kala was right. It was seriously poisonous, and its tail was sparkly. Curly found himself backing up. I think you're getting carried away, he said to Kala. Yeah, you think? The dog trainer had hauled him towards the fence to point out another moccasin, and then another, and then another, nine in all. Curly was flabbergasted. What do you think now? You think Callow is still a nutty fruit bar? I can't explain it, Curly said shakily. Maybe all this rain brought him out of the swamp? Yeah, sure. Listen, I, no, you listen. Each one of these dogs is worth 3,000 US dollars. That's 12,000 dogs barking in that truck. What happens if a dog gets bit by a snake? Dog dies, yeah. I, I don't know about, I didn't know about the snakes, I swear. It's a miracle the dogs are okay. Pokey face, the snake came this close. Callow indicated a distance of about a yard. I take Umbrella and I push him away. It was just about then that Callow accidentally stepped in an aloe burrow and twisted his ankle. Rejecting Curly's offer of assistance, the dog trainer had hopped on one leg to the camper truck. I go now, don't ever call me again, he had fumed. Look, I said I was sorry, how much do I owe you? Two bills I sent, one for the dogs and one for my leg. Aw, oh, come on. Okay, maybe not. Maybe I talked to a lawyer instead. Callow's pale eyes had been gleaming. Maybe I cannot no longer train dogs. My leg hurts so much. Maybe I go on what you say, disability. For Pete's sake. Mother's Paula is a very big company, has lots of money, yeah? 
After Kala roared, roared away, Curly carefully made his way to the trailer. The cottonmouth was no longer sunning on the steps, but Curly didn't take any chances. He set up a stepladder and hoisted himself through a window. Fortunately, he'd saved the telephone number of the reptile wrangler who had successfully removed the alligators from the toilets. The guy was, the guy was tied up in an iguana call, but his secretary promised he'd come to the construction site as soon as possible. Curly had holed up in the trailer for almost three hours until the reptile wrangler pulled up to the gate. Armed with only a pillowcase and a modified five iron, the guy had methodically scoured the Pancake House property and searched for the sparkle-tailed moccasins. Incredibly, he'd found none. That's not possible, Curly exclaimed. They were all over the place this morning. The reptile wrangler had shrugged. Snakes can be unpredictable. Who knows where they went? That is not what I want to hear. You sure they were moccasins? I never saw one with a shiny tail. Thanks for all your help, Curly said snidely and slammed the trailer door. Now it was he who was on the receiving end of peevish sarcasm. Maybe you can train the snakes to guard the property, Chuck Muckle was saying, since the dogs didn't work out. It ain't so funny. You got that right, Mr. Brana. It's not funny at all. Them cottonmouths can kill a person, Curly said. Really? Can they kill a bulldozer too? Well, uh, probably not. Then what are you waiting for? Yes, sir. First thing Monday morning. Music to my ears, Chuck Muckle said. The janitorial closet smelled pungently of bleach and cleaning solvents. Inside, it was almost black as night. Danerson had, Dana Matherson had reached out and snagged Roy as he ran towards the gym, pulling him to the closet and slamming the door. Nimbly, Roy had um, skirted out of Dana's moist grasp, and now he huddled in a cluttered floor while Dana stumbled around, punching blindly. Scooting on the seat of his pants, Roy made his way towards a paper-thin strip of light that he assumed was the shining crack beneath the door. From somewhere above came a bang and then a pained yelp. Apparently, Dana had delivered a ferocious uppercut to an alum aluminum bucket. Somehow, Roy located the doorknob in the darkness. He then flung the door open and lunged for freedom. Only his head made it out to the doorway before Dana caught him. Roy's fingertips squeezed across, squeaked across the linoleum as he was pulled back, and again the door closed on his shouts for help. As Dana yanked him off the floor, Roy desperately groped for something which to defend himself. His... His right hand found what felt like a wooden broom handle. I got you now, cowgirl. Roy, he locked Roy in a fierce bear hug that emptied the air from his lungs like an accordion. His arms were pinned to his sides and his legs dangled limply like a rag doll's. You weren't so sorry you messed with me now, right? Dana gloated. As Roy grew dizzy, the broom handle dropped from his fingers and as Roy's fill, his ears fell with the sounds of crashing waves. Dana's clench was smothering, but Roy found he could still move his lower legs. With all of his strength, he started thrashing both feet. For a moment, nothing happened. Then Roy felt himself falling. He landed face up so that his backpack absorbed the impact. It was still too dark to see, but Roy surmised from Dana's whimpering grasp that he'd kicked a very sensitive part of his body. Roy knew he had to move swiftly. He tried to roll over, but he was weak and breathless from Roy's brutish hug. He lay there helplessly like a turtle that had been flipped on its back. When he heard Dana bellow, Roy closed his eyes and guided, guarded himself for the worst. Dana fell heavily upon him, clamping his meaty paws around Roy's throat. This is it, Roy thought. This dumb goon is really going to kill me. Roy felt hot tears rolling down his cheeks. Sorry, Mom. Maybe you and Dad can try again. Suddenly, the door of the utility closet flew open, and the weight on Roy's chest seemed to vaporize. He opened his eyes just as Dana Matherson was being lifted away, arms flailing, a stunned expression on his pug face. Roy remained on the floor, catching his breath and trying to sort out what just happened. Maybe Mr. Ryan had overheard the sounds of the struggle. He was plenty strong enough to hoist Dana like a bale of alfalfa. Eventually, Roy flopped over and got to his feet. He fumbled for the light switch and rearmed himself with the broom handle, just in case. When he poked his head out of the closet, he saw that the hallway was deserted. Roy dropped the broom handle and streaked to the nearest exit. He almost made it, too. I'm going to share my screen for this chapter's reading comprehension questions. So chapter nine's questions, what animal did the intruder leave at the construction site? So what scared away the dogs? Two, did Dana Matherson continue to terrorize Roy this chapter? Yes or no? Thanks for reading with me today. I'll see you again tomorrow.